since I'm up here, we should sing something. <clears throat> so in our scripture reading uh, this morning that Kirby read for us, uh, Paul, at the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians, uh, as he typically does, uh, cuts to the heart of the matter. It says that he resolves to, to not come to them with, and I'm paraphrasing here, we, we certainly just read it, but uh, anything more than Jesus Christ and him crucified. He resolved, he decided, your, your uh, scripture, your, your Bible man said something different uh, in, in that space, but uh, he resolved to know nothing more uh, than Jesus Christ and him crucified. And it sounds so simple, but we know, uh, as Charlie alluded to um, in the message uh, for communion, how deep that true statement, that simple statement truly is. And so this morning we're going to talk about uh, resolutions. This would be a sermon that typically, um, if I were to preach it, it would be uh, one of the first ones in the new year uh, when people are typically uh, setting resolutions. But I found it rather uh, appropriate, I think, any time uh, for the resolutions we're going to talk about this morning. is There's always a good time to talk about it. But this is about the time of year when all of those well-intentioned resolutions that we set at the beginning of the year, we kind of start to, to lose steam, right? Lose a little uh, momentum uh, on those. I don't know um, if these, uh, accurate, these statistics are accurate. I think 100% of uh, statistics are made up most of the time. Uh, but it's said that almost 70% of, of people um, in the world set New Year's resolutions, right? And, and maybe there's people um, in this room today that, that did so. And they run the gamut. Right. It could be uh, we're going to you're going to be more healthy. You're going to uh, make more money. You're going to see people uh, more often. You're going to uh, laugh more, love more, worry less. Who knows? Um, I could always tell uh, the season of resolution had arrived when, when I was still at, at FedEx as a driver uh, because we'd come out of, of the Christmas season with all the, the, the deliveries of, of gifts and goodies and whatnot. About January, February ish, the packages took on the size of, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, treadmills, uh, Peloton bicycles, uh, that type of thing, and invariably probably deliveries to people who are resolved to get in, in shape. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Uh, we are certainly commanded. We, we know that our temple, certainly as Christians, our, our, te- our bodies are the temple of, uh, of God, and we're commanded certainly to, to, to take care of them. But uh, invariably, I think probably what happened was, and I, I used to joke to, to Jennifer that I would come home and say, well, I just delivered a whole bunch of expensive towel racks today, right? Usually what will happen, you'll, you'll start off with, with, the, with the best intentions and you'll get up early and, and you'll do all these things and then life kind of gets in the way, right? That 5 o'clock alarm starts to be 5.30, starts to be 6 o'clock and uh, you look at the treadmill, well, you know, tomorrow or the next day or the next day and for whatever reason. Uh, the, the treadmill and the good intentions kind of go to the side of the, uh, of the room and, or maybe down in the basement, which interesting enough is where our treadmill is, so... Why do we fail in our resolutions? It's not because we set them and expect to fail. We have great intentions. And the things that we want to do are, are important to us. And, and certainly we, we come out and, and look to try to uh, do the best we can with whatever our resolution is. There's a variety of reasons, right? I, I'm by no means an expert in that. But I think, you know, sometimes we, we bite off more than we can chew, if you'll pardon the pun. All right? We want to change how we eat, so I'm going to cut out all red meat. That hurts just thinking about it. We bite off more than we can chew. We want to do all this. We have all these great intentions. And, you know, maybe we don't, we, we want to not go out and, and spend so much time out or eating out or, or, or you know, or, or spending time with, with friends. We want to be home more with our families and, and things of that nature. And so we really don't change our environment, right? Our friends are going out there. Maybe they're going out late at night. And, and that was kind of our scene. But now in the new year, we, we don't want to do that anymore. But we don't change our friends. And so we kind of find ourselves alone in this new resolution. And, Pretty soon, maybe we get we get left um, on the wayside, or maybe, and maybe more intentionally. And this is where we'll kind of get into the lesson. Maybe there's something in our life we want, we say we want to give up, but when push comes to shove, and our life really needs to change, we're incapable or unwilling to make those changes. So we're going to talk about four uh, resolutions uh, this morning. And as we start to go through them, if it sounds familiar, it will, uh, because we're literally going to sing them later um, as the invitation song. So if you'd like a, an outline for this morning, uh, you can literally open your songbook to the, uh, the song that, that Josh is going to lead us uh, in uh, later on. And this is where 
uh, our lessons are, are going to come from. It's certainly not every song is, is, comes directly from, from Scripture, but I think that, that the message of this song, we can certainly, and we'll see the Scriptures uh, that support it, uh, the message of this song, uh, I Am Resolved, uh, is something that as Christians, maybe it's, it's the right time uh, to be reminded of these resolutions as we, as we choose to, to change our life. And so our first resolution this morning, we could say, I'm resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. You know, it's often said that Satan does not pursue those he has. And so if we are not of the family of Satan, who do you think he's going to try to come after? Those of us who are uh, God's children, those of us who are in God's sheepfold, uh, if you will. And he's going to come after us uh, with all that he has because he knows for each person that he gets, that's one less God has uh, to serve him. And so we talk about the world's delights, and I think it's it's not just uh, non-sinful things, but certainly if you look at uh, the world today and what the world calls delights, it's let's call it what it is, it's sin. But sin never set, presents itself uh, first and foremost, in the ugly form that we know it to be. If you think about the commercials, uh, it's not so much uh, anymore uh, these days, but you think about commercials for whether it be cigarettes or, or alcohol or whatever it might be, they never show a, a crash. They never show, when, when they were showing cigarette ads on, on television, they never showed the, the, uh, the aftermath of lung disease. They always showed pe- young people having a great time and partying and, and all these other things. And why do you think that is? is because if the world's delights were truly shown to be what they are, the sin and the destruction and death that that is in this world, in all likelihood, there would be far less that partook. And just as Jesus does, Satan tends to meet us where we're at. Not everything that tempts me is going to tempt you and, and, and vice versa. One of the biggest contradictions and one of the biggest ways Satan can get us is, is one of two ways. Either he'll try to convince us that we have no sin, Or he'll try to convince us that we're perfect and we don't need God's salvation. And I don't know which of of those two is the more dangerous fallacy. We know all have sinned, even those of us who are Christians. What does it say in Romans 23, verse 23 through 26? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so as long as we linger charmed by the world's delight where our eyes aren't elevated to those things that are higher and nobler and those things that can allure our sight. When I think about this, I'm reminded of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 and following when he uh, approaches Jesus and asks him what he must do to uh, inherit eternal life. We remember what he said. Jesus begins to name off all those things that he shouldn't do. He shouldn't murder. He shouldn't bear false witness. He should honor his father and mother. And you can almost see the rich young ruler sort of, you know, elevating himself up, puffing his chest out. And he says, all these things I've done since I was a child. And what did the scripture say? Jesus said, it said, Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And he said, one thing you lack. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you'll have riches in heaven and then come follow me. So what did the rich young ruler do? He immediately ran away and sold everything he had, right? What does the scripture say? It said he went away sorrowful. For he had great wealth. He had been charmed by the world's delight. I'm struck by that fact that Jesus knew his heart. He knew what the answer was going to be before he even asked him what he needed to do. And yet he loved him anyway. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, we read, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is gone. Behold, uh, the new has come. I know I've preached from this uh, before as well, but anytime I'm thinking about things that are higher or nobler, things that have allured my sight, I'm always pulled back to uh, the book of Colossians. Colossians uh, chapter 3, where Paul outlines to the church in Colossae the change in life. If you are no longer charmed by the world's delight, if you have raised your eyes and looking for things uh, above the earth, we've talked about this certainly before, but Uh, It never hurts to be reminded. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Colossians, we read, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your minds on things that are above, not on earthly things. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And then Paul begins to to outline in in verse 5 what we might term the the world's delight and all the things that uh, if we are to live a different life, we are to put to death. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of those, the wrath of God is coming, and in those, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another. For as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all of these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And so let us resolve this morning together not to be charmed by the world's delight and to elevate our eyes, not just the things that are higher or nobler, but understand the power that is within God as a new creature and let us live our lives in service to him. Second resolution this morning would be the second verse of our song. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. And he hath the words of life. In John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69, we read about many that were no longer following. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter, and I love his, his response, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed. John records as well in John 1 and verse 12, but all, but to all who did receive him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. One of the issues, I think, with, with resolutions uh, is that we, in, in the physical sense, in the worldly sense, we, we try to look for that, that quick fix, right? We're going to take this pill. We're going to drink this this potion. We're going to do whatever it is uh, that we need to do. And and all of the, whether it be the exercise or the exercise equipment or or, or the pills, they all sound like they're the one, right? You've got exercise pill number one that has all these natural ingredients. And if you take it, you're you're going to be healthy. And then pill number two says, well, well, yeah, but I have all of that and I have Icelandic glacier water or whatever. Uh, And then the third one, it says, well, I have Icelandic glacier water and I have dust from a unicorn's hoof. At the end of the day, they're not the true one. They're not the just one. And they're not going to change, honestly, the way uh, that we live our life. But the beauty of resolving to go to the Savior is he is the true one. He is the just one, not one of. He is the one. And through him, we have the words of life. So we don't linger. We're not charmed by the world's delight. We resolve to, to go to the Savior understanding that he is the true one. And we also resolve, verse 3, to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth. He is the living way. When you look at this, you can't help but think of John 14, verse 6, which I'm I'm sure uh, most of us know. What does it say there? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. The writer of Hebrews has much the same thought over in Hebrews chapter 10. (coughs) Hebrews chapter 10, if we start reading together in verse 19, we read, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that is opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God. 
Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurances of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching near. You see, God in his infinite wisdom knew that we as Christians living in the world would, would struggle with sin. He knew that we would be uh, weak if we were out there on our, on our own. And so he instituted this body of his, of his blood, the church, where we can worship together, where we can admonish one another, we can, we can sing to one another with, with psalms and hymns as is written elsewhere, uh, and we can be that support in each other's resolutions to live uh, a better life as he would have us live. John 15 and verse 14, how are, how are we known as the friends of Jesus? What did he say? You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. James 1, through 25, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. You see, resolving to follow the Savior doesn't simply mean we follow and then have everything happen to us. We heed what he says, and heeding what he says will enable uh, us to do what he wills. And he is the living way. There are many ways, and maybe in your physical resolution, again, that can be promised that you'll if you do this, you'll, you'll have your reward. But we know there is only one way back to the side of the Father, and it is through Jesus Christ, his Son. And finally, we resolve this morning, verse 4, we resolve, I am resolved, to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me. Still will I enter in. In Matthew 5, at the end of what we would call the Beatitudes, verses 10 through 12, what are we told? We're told that we're uh, blessed are, are you when, when men persecute you and speak evil of you and, and, and do all kinds of, of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for in the same way <clears throat> were the prophets persecuted uh, before us. You see, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And if we were, if John 15, 19, and 20, as we know, if we were of the world, would the world would love us because we would be one of their own. But as we live here uh, in the world today, we are not, if we are truly Christians, we are not uh, of the world. And so we're reminded in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus said it himself very succinctly in John 16 and verse 33. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, we're going to be frustrated. In this world, we're going to have uh, things happen to us, and we're going to be uh, surrounded by sin in our lives. But praise God, Luke 16, 30, 33 didn't end there. What does he say? He says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. <clears throat> James 1, verses 2 through 4, we certainly know well. Count it all joy, my brother. When you encounter uh, persecutions of any time, of any kind, before you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So, if we're resolved to enter the kingdom and leave these these paths of sin, not everyone we've known in our life will come with us. There'll be people that look at us and, and not understand why we're different and why we live a different life than we did. And as I said, Satan does not pursue those he has, and he knows how talented uh, and how on fire for God. If people are on fire for God, how much of a difference they can make in this world, and he doesn't want that. So he will certainly send foes uh, to beset us. But if we're resolved to enter that kingdom, we know, as, as Jesus said, he will uh, provide that support for us. So what's the end of our resolutions? What does the chorus say of the song? I will hasten to him. Hasten, glad and free, Jesus highest, I will come to thee. So what is your resolution this morning? Are there things in your life that, that you're struggling with? Are there things that uh, maybe are pulling you away from, from doing what you want to do, from living the life that you know God would, would have you live? Are you struggling maybe with, with who Jesus is, with who God truly is in your life? Or maybe you have some opposition in your life that you're struggling to, to get over because you want to do the right thing. The beauty of this life and the beauty of this walk and, and, and the beauty of these resolutions is we don't have to do these all uh, on our own. And God has promised us that he will uh, be with us and support us 
and he has provided us this family to support us as well. And so this morning, if we can help you with your resolutions or if there's anything else that we can do to support you in this walk of life, we ask you let it be known as we stand and as we sing. I am the Lord.